Good evening. Uh, welcome, uh, one and all. My name is Hank Clark. I'm Program Director of the Political Economy Project, and I want to welcome all of you here this evening. Uh, I'd like to begin by uh, saying that if you would like to be on our mailing list but are not, uh, please feel free to stop up after tonight's event and uh, sign your name in, and we will make sure and take care of that. We recently passed the 700 mark on our uh, email list, which is the largest we've ever had, and uh, we'd love to have you be part of it as well. Let me make just uh, two or three quick announcements about forthcoming events in the, uh, in the PEP. On Wednesday evening, we have a talk by uh, Dennis Rasmussen from Tufts University, who will be discussing his book, The Infidel and the Professor, The Friendship That Shaped Modern Thought. And the friendship is between Adam Smith and David Hume. So those of you who are interested in the Scottish Enlightenment or in the intellectual history of commercial society or capitalism, commercial society, I guess, since we're about to learn that capitalism doesn't exist, um, are more than welcome to uh, attend that event. It will take place on a Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. in Haldeman 041. It is free and open to the public, and all of you are welcome. Next Monday, the um, 6th of uh, May, Professor Paul Novosat of the Economics Department will give the next in our series of Monday night dinners it will be entitled, Organized Crime and the Origins of the State. And that one will take place at 6 p.m. also in uh, Rocky, I believe it's in Rocky Two, And you're welcome uh, to that one uh, uh, as well. Um, those of you who are uh, looking at the course selection for this coming summer, that is a, a term that begins in about six weeks, uh, professor Yasha Mount will be a visiting professor here offering a course on populism and liberal democracy. And uh, that is something you will definitely want to look into. Yasha Mount is one of the uh, brightest, most accomplished, young, uh, comparative politics people in the world. Uh, his book, The People Against Democracy, uh, sort of predicted the rise of Trump. And, uh, and he will be here teaching a course called Gov 84.37, I think it is. It's a Gov seminar course on populism and liberal democracy. And that'll be this summer, um, courtesy of the Political Economy Project. So um, without further ado, uh, yeah. let me introduce Professor uh, Mayor Cohn. He needs no introduction, so I won't give him much of one. He is a legendary professor here at Dartmouth for his teaching, his uh, informal reading groups, his, uh, his erudition, his, uh, uh, his public lectures, and his patience also, because uh, he's been standing and waiting for quite a while for me to get finished talking. So I will finish talking, and I'll give you Professor Mayor Cohn. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. So this is the second in my uh, series of why there is no such thing as. Some of you may have uh, seen my, been to my talk on uh, market failure. Um, so the argument is uh, that I'm going to make is that sort of the standard story about capitalism and communism is wrong in some important ways, and that, which I'll uh, get into uh, immediately, and that there's a much better way of thinking about the differences between economic systems that makes clear what those differences are, and that's what I'll be doing. So first of all, let me tell you sort of the standard story. <coughs> um, there are two alternative economic systems. This is too loud. put it further away, it should be not as loud. Is that still okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay, good. Um, there are two alternative economic systems, capitalism and communism. Both of these are relatively recent. Um, uh, capitalism replaced feudalism, uh, an older system in the 19th century, something to do with the Industrial Revolution. 
Um, communism appeared in Russia in 1917 and spread to other countries, China in particular, uh, later in the 20th century. So relatively new, that's the first thing. The second thing is this sort of a standard explanation of what the difference is between them. And um, <coughs> in ca under capitalism, prices are determined in free markets, private ownership, and there's private ownership and control of production. Under communism, prices are set by the state. State ownership, uh, the state owns the means of production and controls the process of production. So I will argue in, against these uh, interpretations that uh, far from being recent, um, what we call capitalism and, and communism are examples of very old economic systems that go back thousands of years. Okay, they're recent manifestations, but there's nothing particularly new in principle about them. Um, <coughs> and secondly, <coughs> uh, the description of how they differ, what I, th I gave you the standard description, it's not that that isn't true. I mean, that is true about what we call capitalism and communism, but it misses the point. It mis misses the, the important distinction between them, which I hope will become clear. <coughs> okay, so I want to begin with my own work, naturally. Um, and uh, as many of you know, I have been studying um, pre-industrial economies for quite a few years now uh, with the goal of understanding how economic progress works, economic development and growth, as it's usually called. <coughs> uh, the focus has been on pre-industrial Europe and China, but I've also looked at sort of earlier periods and more modern periods. So I've sort of looked at a very big chunk of economic and political history, and so a lot of it in considerable detail. So I'm going to give you the elevator version of uh, what I found. <coughs> so looking at all this evidence, all of this history, um, it's pretty clear that um, economic activity is not just production. Okay, economics, you take your economics classes, it's all very much focused on production, and um, that's key, I mean, production is really important, but there are two other economic activities, two other ways that people make a living that are key to understanding how things work. One of those ways is through commerce, and that is buying and selling things that other people make. Okay, you're not actually making anything, except maybe a profit, um, but the idea is to buy and sell things that other people produce, okay? Um, <coughs> and um, to understand economic progress, we need to understand the interaction between commerce and production. It's the interaction between them creates sort of a self-perpetuating process that gives us economic progress. It's the interaction between them, okay? Um, <coughs> there's n it's self-perpetuating in that there's no external cause, nothing miraculous needs to happen for this to go. It, it arises naturally, continues naturally, and is cumulative, and just gets better and better, okay? And pretty much exponentially. So a lot of sort of what people consider the break around 1800 was just the curve getting steeper, okay? <coughs> um, so, if it's a natural process, self-perpetuating, why isn't everybody rich? Uh, and why weren't they always rich? And the answer is that the pace of economic progress isn't determined by causes, it's determined by obstacles, okay? So it's the presence or absence of obstacles that explains the differences in the pace of economic progress. <coughs> and the primary obstacle is the third economic activity, which is predation, which is using force to take stuff from people who produce or trade, okay? And this economic act, we don't like it. I mean, I'm, I don't, I mean, I don't know. Views may differ, I sort of frown on it, but it's a very old uh, economic activity. In most societies, it has been the most respected economic activity. People engaged in it are called the nobility. Um, <coughs> So, you know, kings and princes, you know, it's 
has a, has a history, okay? In terms of understanding economic progress, the importance of predation is that it's the main obstacle, okay? If predation is too bad, this self-perpetuating process grinds to a halt or goes into reverse and, you know, people are in, people are in trouble, people are poor uh, and stay poor and get poorer, okay? Um, and uh, the, way that it w the way that it interacts with economic evolution is if economic evolution creates economic progress, there's more prosperity, there's more stuff, taking it becomes more attractive, <laughs> more productive, okay? So predation increases in response, and in the bad cases, it increases enough to kill off the process that is creating the prosperity, okay? So it's kind of a negative feedback. And in fact, it's this predation trap process that is responsible for all of the sort of reversals, not the uh, more well-known Malthusian trap. The Malthusian trap, I should give a talk on why there is no such thing as the Malthusian trap. <coughs> uh, maybe. So there's actually an interesting example. So, oh, oh finally, the, the economic evolution isn't helpless in the face of predation, okay? It finds ways of avoiding, evading, <coughs> protecting itself, uh, and carrying on. Okay, so uh, one of the big things of economic, you know, of, co of commerce and, and production is sort of protecting themselves against production. <coughs> so um, there's a, a very important example of this uh, sort of predator prey uh, story between uh, of the predation trap and the response to it in the origins of government, okay? So uh, we said prosperity, you know, stuff, uh, opportunity attracts predation. So the first Im an important example of that was the um, uh, growth of sedentary agriculture, the spread of sedentary agriculture. In the right places, sedentary agriculture was a perfect target for predation. They couldn't run away from you. Okay, so uh, groups of uh, armed men uh, would take over a territory, okay, control it, collect tribute, um, and this would be a kingdom or an empire or whatever. Okay, so one of the origins in, uh, uh, of government is in this um, predation increasing in response to prosperity. So um, there were populations very early on that were sufficiently concentrated and wealthy that they had some chance of actually defending themselves, getting together and defending themselves. To do so, they set up a very different type of government that I call associational government. So these were principally commercial cities. Commercial cities established a different form of government um, and um, that managed to keep things going very, where in many parts, not many, in some parts of the world. Okay, Mediterranean is a very uh, important example, okay? So, um, that's sort of the, <coughs> the basic way that I understand economic and political history. So government, you know, after it originated in that way, it continued to evolve, it interacted with economic evolution, uh, and changed, and economic evolution changed in response to what government was doing, and so that, that went on, okay? Anyhow, in looking at all this stuff, I have found only three economic systems, three types of economy, okay? And we can differentiate them in terms of the three basic economic activity. Okay, I'll just enumerate them first, and I'll talk about each of them in a little bit more detail. So if there's, you have to have production, right? Otherwise you don't eat. So they all have production. It's the predation and commerce that vary, okay? To give you the different types. If you only have production, if there's no significant commerce or significant or organized predation, uh, you have what is called, not just by me, a subsistence economy, okay? <laughs> if you uh, have production, and put on top of it um, a uh, organized predation, the predatory government that I talked about, 
you have a tribute economy. Okay? So there's production, pred organized predation, but no significant commerce. If you have um, production and add to it commerce, you have a commercial economy. Okay? And um, to anticipate a little bit, the tribute economy is sort of is what we're talking about when we talk about communism. The commercial economy is what we're talking about when we talk about capitalism. Okay, so I'll look at each of them in, in a little bit more detail. So first of all, the subsistence economy. <coughs> Households produce for their own consumption. Um, they're largely self-sufficient. There's uh, still some local exchange. People do trade exchange with one another. Okay, there may even be in a community some specialization, some division of labor. Uh, but all exchange is local and direct. Okay, there's no commerce and therefore no long distance exchange. People are not really trading with others who are far away, just in their immediate uh, neighborhood or community. Okay. Examples uh, of subsistence economies, hunter-gatherers, pastoral tribes, uh, and some arable agriculture. Okay. Arable agriculture, we said, is a problem. It doesn't last very long before the predation lands on it. But actually, there are places where sort of it's, easy, it's relatively easy for people to move. So if the predation settles on them, they can move away. And there's places where it's not all that productive, so the predators aren't that interested. So you will see subsistence sort of sedentary agriculture in some places. Um, <coughs> so uh, an important point that I want to emphasize, uh, and, and it's sort of important for, the con for what, what is coming, the source of productivity of human societies is the social organization of production. It's not that, the w that we're individually terribly smart, um, we're not, <laughs> compared to other primates. We're, you know, we're not dumber than the chimpanzees, but uh, we're not that much smarter. The big difference is our social organization. We're very successful in organizing our society. And um, it's sort of Adam Smith's big uh, insight, the, the, the division of labor is uh, what he, what I call is, is, is an example of social organization. There's other components to it, but that's uh, an important one, okay? Um, and a property of the social organization of production is that the larger the amount of economic activity organized, there are big economies of scale, okay? So Adam Smith will tell you that the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. So if we have social organization over a continent or over the world, the opportunities for exploiting the social organization are enormously greater than if we have social organization in a village, okay? Um, so in a subsistence economy, there is some social organization, but it's very local, it's very small scale, and productivity is correspondingly very low, okay? So one takeaway from this, I, there's often you see the motto, buy local, okay, if you actually do that, okay, if everyone was doing that, we'd have a subsistence economy, and we would be very, very poor, okay. <laughs> so think before you buy into that idea, uh, okay. All right, let's go on to the tribute economy, um, and we start with something like a subsistence economy and we add this layer of organized predation, um, predatory government, um, which collects tribute from its subject population. And the tribute is usually in kind. Um, typically grain, cloth are popular items. Uh, but actually, usually the biggest item is labor. Okay, that the, the, the population is required to do what is called corvée labor, is mobilized, not just for the military, although for the military too, but for all kinds of different things. So a certain amount of your time every year you're going to spend in corvée labor. We just had uh, Passover. The Jews actually weren't slaves in Egypt. They were subject to corvée labor. 
So certain parts of the year, they had to go and help build pyramids. Okay, the rest of the year, they lived you know, where they lived and could get on with their lives. Okay, that's sort of typical uh, in, in a tribute economy. <coughs> um, okay, it's sometimes in a tribute economy, so in a tribute economy, it's also what, what we call a command economy to some extent. So the government will tell people what to produce for them. Okay, it's not up to them uh, what goods they produce. And in addition, this labor that they supply, very often the government will take that labor and organize it and use it for production. Okay? Um, and uh, the most developed example that I'm aware of is, which and it's also I've studied China, is the Chinese tribute state that originated with the Qin Dynasty some 200 years BC. Okay? So China developed a very sophisticated tribute economy. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about it as we continue. So in a tribute economy, production is primarily for tribute and subsistence. There's some local exchange, but little commerce. Again, um, in the Chinese tribute state, commerce was not just absent, but it was actually suppressed. The tribute state didn't want commerce coming in and messing things up. It was very happy with the way things were arranged already. Okay? The tribute economy can still be much more productive than a subsistence economy. And the reason is it has a fairly large-scale system <coughs> of social organization. So the Chinese government mobilized sometimes millions uh, of workers to build the Great Wall, for example. The Egyptians built the pyramids. The Chinese had huge industries, okay, which were uh, employed corvée labor. Um, they moved stuff around, the they didn't have much internal trade, but they moved stuff around the country, tribute goods, the government moved it around the country. So you had a form of social organization that was not very efficient, but even inefficient social organization is much more productive than no social organization. So, um, okay, um, let us continue. So, tribute economy, other examples of tribute economy. Um, feudalism is an example of a tribute economy. And, uh, however, it was a very poor cousin of the Chinese tribute state, okay? It was very fragmented, it was very localized, um, there was really, the, it was just local lords collecting tribute from their uh, manors, from their, you know, the areas that they controlled. It was not centralized in any way. The only thing that was centralized was military mobilization. Okay, but the, the economy was not. The economy was very fragmented. Productivity was very low. And um, travelers from late medieval Europe who went to China, Marco Polo comes to mind, were extremely impressed with what they saw. Okay, it was a much, much richer economy. Um, it actually had a little bit commercialized at the time that, that, that Marco Polo was there, so it was better than it usually was. But uh, it was still basically largely a tribute economy, but, you know, relatively rich. <coughs> okay. So, um, any other examples of a tribute economy come to mind? Any suggestions? No? Communism. Okay. Communism fits our description perfectly. Okay. Uh, the government directs labor, the government allocates the goods. Um, done by force, you don't have any choice. Um, commerce is not only discouraged, it's a felony. Okay, so there's no commerce. So it's a tribute economy, very much like um, the Chinese tribute state, and we'll come back to that similarity uh, in a minute. Okay? All right, our a uh, third type of economy, okay, the commercial economy. So in a commercial economy, there are people who, are, who specialize, who make a living in buying and selling, 
in facilitating exchange, who organize to carry out exchange over long distances. Um, there's a much more, there's a much larger market, okay? The extent of the market is much greater. There's a larger scale of so social organization. Productivity is much higher. <coughs> and people mainly produce for sale. They, they, they don't produce for their own consumption. They satisfy their own needs by buying in the market, okay? So commerce transforms subsistence economies into commercial economies. Okay. It arises spontaneously or it comes from somewhere else and it will transform a subsistence economy into a commercial economy. <coughs> uh, it can also, if it's allowed to, transform a tribute economy into a commercial economy. And in Europe, that is what happened. Okay. The feudal tribute economy was transformed by commerce over a long period of time into a commercial economy. Um, uh, and even in China, okay, every, every so often the tributes, the classical tribute state would be weakened, usually internal struggles, um, or it would even fragment. And with the state weakened, commerce would pop up and commercialize things and they'd have a period of prosperity. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay. So commercialization, turning subsistence or tribute into a commercial economy is a slow process and a gradual one. It takes often centuries. And the commercial economy that I described, that you could call that a fully commercialized economy. Okay, that actually um, very often the commercialization is less than complete. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, as I suggested earlier, uh, another name for a commercial economy, a fully commercialized economy, is our friend capitalism. Okay, so capitalism is a, a name for a commercial economy. <coughs> and um, it didn't happen suddenly uh, uh, in the 19th century something as a result of the Enlightenment or the Industrial Revolution or uh, solar flares or anything else, okay? Europe had been a process of gradual commercialization at least from the 12th century, okay? There have been interruptions, the predation trap was at work, but from 16th, 17th century, there weren't really serious interruptions and this process continued smoothly, okay? Um, what was perhaps different in the 19th century was that in the m more advanced economy is they were all sort of pretty much commercialized. Uh, although even, you know, in Smith's day, the highlands were a bit questionable um, and there were sort of pockets of quasi-subsistence all over, certainly all over Europe, but mostly it was sort of commercialized. Um, how did it get the name capitalism? What does capital have to do with it? <coughs> um, well, uh, what did happen in the 19th century was um, the composition of capital in the economy shifted. Okay? The ca uh, for those of you who have taken 26 will know what I'm talking about and maybe anyhow I can't really go into the details. But to produce, to engage in commerce, all of these things you need capital. Okay? You need to be able to um, invest resources in the process of production, in the process of commerce. Um, and historically, most capital has been working capital. It hasn't been uh, big machines and, and factories and things like that, but it's been money invested in the inventory that, uh, in the stock that merchants are carrying with them and trading in other places, okay? So with the 19th century, fixed capital became more important. We started seeing these big factories, particularly actually late in the 19th century. Um, large factories, fixed capital became very uh, visible. And you could say that was sort of a change. And in fact, that period seems to be over. Uh, those of you who have taken 26 recently, um, I, we talk a little bit about intangible capital. 
that in today's economy, the fixed capital is no longer that big a deal. Uh, the, in, uh, the intangible capital has been of growing importance. So things like knowledge, investment in organization, in ways of doing things, all of these things um, have become more important. So neither of these changes in the sort of composition of capital changes the economic system. Okay, it doesn't really matter. Before all this, these big factories existed, it was a commercial economy. After they existed, it was a commercial economy. Now that they're less important parts of things and we have a lot of intangible capital, it's still a commercial economy. So the basic economic system has remained the same. Okay? All right, so let me sum up. <laughs> Whoops, sorry. Um, neither capitalism nor communism is new. Examples of tribute economies and commercial economies existed in the ancient world. Um, the history of commercial economy in Europe, in particular of our commercial economy, goes back at least to the 12th century with some minor interruptions, I don't know, some major interruptions, but with some continuity, and no serious in, in interruptions since the 16th century. Um, and so the commercial economy developed steadily in parts of Europe, not all of Europe, uh, and it produced the, what we call the Industrial Revolution in the late uh, 18th century. Um, but no, as I said, no change in the economic system. The system continued. Commercial economy before, commercial economy afterwards. Um, communism. Communism is a throwback to the tribute economy. Okay? It's a very ancient thing. It's a throwback. This is most clear in China. I remember making this saying that really the communist revolution was something that had happened repeatedly in Chinese history was the reestablishment of the classical tribute state. It was just like the, 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 the Ming Dynasty, the first Ming emperor did things very much like now. And the Chinese student I was telling this to said, yeah, everyone knows that, that was Mao's big hero. Okay, he modeled a lot of the things he did on the first Ming emperor. So communism isn't something new, it's something actually quite ancient. It's been tried before, <laughs> um, and uh, we'll talk about why it doesn't uh, do so ter terribly well, okay? So what is the key difference then between uh, a commercial economy and a tribute economy, what, we, what is usually called capitalism and communism? So the key difference is not who owns capital, how prices are set, or even free markets, and it's not clear how free ours are, uh, by the way. Um, it, there are differences in those things, but that's not the key distinction. The distinction that I focused on, and I'll explain why it's the key, is the presence or absence of commerce. Commerce is what makes things happen, okay? Commercial economy, there's this self-perpetuating process that's moving things forward. Tribute economy, it's not there. It's not there, okay? Um, what is the consequence of it not being there? Uh, there's no dynamics, okay? It's commerce that creates the dynamics. So it has two manifestations. One is tribute economies are stagnant. There is no mechanism for economic progress. They do not progress or they progress extremely slowly. Okay. <laughs> they progress very often by borrowing stuff from commercial economies or getting stuff from commercial economies. But on their own, they're not capable, really, of generating economic progress. Um, so, uh, for example, of the difference, I, I, I said that the, the Chinese tribute state that Marco Polo saw was phenomenal compared to medieval Europe. But medieval Europe... Uh, there was commerce, okay? Feudalism was pretty backward, but commerce was at work. Over the centuries, okay, we got to the modern economy. In China, the tribute state went nowhere, okay? Um, and this is called, in the, lit in the economic history literature, the great divergence. 
okay, why was China so far ahead uh, in the early on and was so backward by, say, you know, <laughs> later on? Okay, well, timing is, a, is an issue. And the answer is commerce, okay? No, no process. Feudalism moved up. The Chinese tribute state, which was way ahead to begin with because social organization was on a much larger scale, went nowhere. Okay? Um, and there were periods that China did better, uh, much better, when the tribute state was weak. But the tribute state was always reimposed. China has never escaped from the tribute state. The most recent escape was with the Cultural Revolution and the weakening of the tribute state. Things are going great guns. But the real danger is it's, <laughs> it's still out there, the tribute state. Um, so th that's a worry. Okay. So one thing is the process of economic progress, economic growth, uh, depends on commerce. If you don't have it, it won't happen. The other thing that depends on commerce is adaptation. Okay. Remember, commerce is the dynamics. Sometimes things need to change quickly in an economy. And the most uh, important example of that is mobilizing for war. Okay? Commercial economies are incredibly good at doing that. Okay? That's why they've won all the wars in uh, recent centuries. Um, there's, I want to recommend there's a wonderful book by Arthur Herman called Freedom's Forge. Uh, about the U.S. mobilization of the U.S. economy in World War II. So uh, last year we had a speaker uh, in the PEP, Mark Harrison, was talking about uh, the Soviet economy. And I, I hadn't really thought about this until he spoke. And he said that the Soviet economy was a permanent war economy. It was mobilized for war on a constant basis. And the reason was they knew that they couldn't do this when they needed to. So they had to be always mobilized for war. In the UK, the US, uh, commercial economies, when the war is over, that, let's get rid of all that stuff and go back to having a good time and, uh, and having economic progress and all these good things. But in a tribute state or a tribute economy, you can't do that because you can't adapt. War breaks out unexpectedly. If you don't have the means already there uh, to produce the arms that you need, uh, you won't get them, because okay? the economy is rigid. Okay? So that's the second thing. So the crucial failing of communism, then, isn't inefficiency, okay? the thing that economists tend to focus on. Okay? It's the lack of dynamism. It's the lack of movement. It's the absence of commerce means that it can't change. It can't change to progress, and it can't change to adapt. That's the defining difference. Um, okay. So, uh, well, it didn't take longer. There's still time for some questions, so please uh, don't hesitate. Yes? Uh, so if you look at China today, a lot of people say uh, right, market economy with Chinese characteristics. Yes. Uh, especially a lot of officials say that. But in your opinion, do you think uh, China today qualifies as an economy with uh, both the layer of tribute economy yeah. and the layer of commercial economy? Um, I didn't talk much about predation in commercial economies. So commercial economies can uh, sustain quite a lot of predation and still carry on. Okay. Adam Smith's term for it, I believe, was there's a lot of ruin in the nation, right? So you can have really atrocious government, bad predation, and the economy manages to go on, finds ways around things. But at some point, no. Okay. It gets too bad, things stop. Okay. So um, what has happened, I, I'm not an expert on modern China. Um, I'm not an expert on China at all but certainly not really on recent things. But it seems like the government predation environment has gotten significantly worse, and we've heard speakers talking about that. And the thing that worries me is Europe took off, okay, the, the, these interruptions, big interruptions ended when there was, or evolved a, a kind of government 
that was much safer for economic progress, okay? Um, very much, it started in the, in the Dutch Republic, adopted in the UK, the, U the US was modeled on that political system, um, and it's been terrific for, uh, for economic progress. China never changed its economic <coughs> system. It still has that, and there's the latency there for the predatory state to reassert itself. If there's some kind of emergency, the instincts of the government will be to take charge, and that will be bad news. The I it's interesting, because in, in the Second World War, I mean, you could say Roosevelt was almost a socialist. I mean, people think of him as, as a socialist, but he wasn't a fool. He understood that to mobilize for war, we need to back off and let the private sector take care of it. That's exactly what he did, and it was phenomenally successful. It's hard to see the Chinese government making a decision like that. Okay. So I'm concerned, because I, I haven't seen the political change Okay, the, the tribute state there was weakened. Things sprung up as they have repeatedly in the past. But is it sustainable? And it, I think it will be sustainable only when there's a change in the political system. And you see Chinese societies outside of the mainland who have had very successful political systems and things look really good there. So there's no reason why it shouldn't happen, but it hasn't. Yes? Uh, do you differentiate between communism and socialism to any degree? Uh, yes, yeah, I do. I, I, I mean, socialism is a, is a much weaker bad idea than communism. <laughs> I mean, it has elements, okay? Socialism in England after in post-World War II uh, went quite, you know, the, 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 it used to be that socialism was the you know, public ownership of the means of production and distribution and so on, which sounds a bit bad. And it was really bad. And, and socialism is sort of backed, people who call themselves socialists have generally backed off from this. Okay, so a lot of people who call themselves socialists just have a collection of what I consider to be bad ideas, but they're not that reminiscent of, of sort of classical socialism, and certainly not of communism. Um, so, yeah. Shame. So, something like Marxism, does that just fall within uh, Marxist society? It isn't an ism. It's, 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 again, there's no such thing. <laughs> uh, mer I, my name for mercantilism was fiscalism. Okay? It was uh, governments, principally uh, what I call the predatory state, France, Spain w w were examples of that, but also to some extent in England, and that got Adam, Adam Smith upset was selling trading monopolies to private uh, associations in exchange for revenue and loans. Okay, so it wasn't motive. I mean, you get the impression sometimes you read that people didn't understand that free trade was a good thing. They didn't care. Okay, the government needs money. Okay, it was a way of raising money. And uh, when they found other ways, better ways of raising money, they generally those ideas. Yes, uh, You mentioned political systems earlier. Are you suggesting that like the best kind of political system for commercialized, for, for commercialized economy is a democracy? No. No, I actually, if you, I, the book I'm writing, I, I suggest that democracy is a real problem. Okay, that it's actually, it's not. <laughs> so the system I'm talking about, the associational state, is limited government with um, consultation with the governed, representation of the governed, but it's not a universal suffrage democracy. It's, um, I don't really have time to go into the details, but governance works fairly well. The government stays limited. Uh, if, you, if you're elected the equivalent of the president, there isn't much you can do to mess things up. You don't have the powers to do that. You're in charge of national defense. The early US Constitution was like that. That was pretty good. But over time, the predation trap has worked on that. Okay, the, the people with political power don't like those constraints. Uh, and they've eroded them. <coughs> and democracy has made it, universal suffrage democracy has weakened governance when 200 million people elect a president, what governance? 
I mean, when 200 pe million people are in charge, no one's in charge. So once the guy's elected, okay, all right, there are further elections, but it doesn't work very, very well. Um, scale is a big problem for these things. Uh, so no, no, actually. And I'm not suggesting replacing democracy. I don't know. I'm not, I, I don't make, you know, I, I don't, uh, when, when people ask me, what should we do in other contexts? You've heard this in Economics 26. I say, I don't do medicine, I do autopsies. <laughs> So I don't know what the answers are, okay? I just know what I observe and the things that I see going on, right? So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. There's been a certain commercial economy development within healthcare, yes. within education, and, and within the democratic process to some extent. Yes. So, uh, have those been productive? Have those been yeah, helpful in terms of um, if you're asking whether I think that private uh, provision of education and healthcare is better than having the government involved in it, the answer is yes. Um, there's a lot of evidence for that. But again, that's not my area. In the period I'm looking at, governments didn't do stuff like that. It was, that's one of the reasons I like the pre-industrial world. It's really simple. Okay, if you told someone, even in the 19th century, that the government is here to help us, they would have looked at you with astonishment. <coughs> okay, it's just a bizarre modern idea, okay, which politicians have invented to you know, get people to vote for them and so on. So, uh, yeah. So I don't know what else were you asking about? Healthcare? Healthcare education and the democratic process election. The democrat, well, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's a big, s I'd be happy to talk to you, that's sort of a long story, yeah, about how, how, how predation has changed its nature in, in sort of, I think, in modern democracies. And what you have is kind of a, what the government has become is kind of a merchant of, in predation. The government, it doesn't, the, the people in government don't make their uh, income by actually stealing themselves. They do sometimes, but that's not the main thing. They mainly make their income by being an agent who will take stuff from you and give it to me and take a you know, nominal commission. Right? So it's kind of a commerce in predation that's developed. It's kind of interesting in terms of uh, the history of predation. So, yeah. Yes? Sorry if you, if you addressed this earlier, um, but in terms of like the front page of the New York Times today is about how some of the biggest companies in the U.S. are not paying federal taxes. And so in terms of taxes, how, and, and just building on the point that you just sort of built upon. Well, that's sort of what, I mean, that's my uh, commerce in predation. So crony capitalism is very much a part of that. Crony capitalism, government, uh, you know, public sector employees, um, all kinds of other things uh, are examples of this. You know, people have politicians organizing predation to the benefit of particular constituency at the expense of the general public and the general good. And there's lots of examples, it's not. I don't, I mean, that, yeah, I, I, I'm no more enthusiastic about crony capitalism than the, the New York Times is. Yeah. But that's just a manifestation of this general sort of degeneration of governance of commercial, uh, the governments of commercial economy. Yes? Have you seen historical examples or any kind of dynamic in which commercial societies revert to uh, tribute state apart without external actors, so where the actual citizens will somehow... Not really. I mean, when it's happened in China, the most recent example is true. The Ming example is the same. Um, uh, that was really the, the important recent examples, uh, um, it was, there was some real sort of disaster beforehand that kind of wiped out the commercial economy and this government came in and had the idea, well, we don't need all this commerce stuff, we're going to organize it ourselves, right? So it's interesting, the Sung <coughs> in China um, reunified China after a period of fragmentation and weak government which was economically fantastic, but they didn't reimpose the tribute economy because 
it was crazy. The revenue they got from this <laughs> commercial economy was huge. They just couldn't bear to give it up. They weren't that religious. Uh, so they sort of went to what you could call, it's actually more like today's China, where the government sort of allows commercial activity. It doesn't really approve of it, but it produces so much stuff. Uh, and it didn't end well for the Song, which is another reason I'm not so optimistic. Okay? But it's interesting that they did not reimpose the tribute economy because it would have been so destructive to their revenue. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes? Could you name a country that has like, the characteristics of, the government, of governments that you kind of like? Small countries, much better. So Switzerland works pretty well, um, some of the Baltics. Uh, the Netherlands is not that bad. The Scandinavian countries are not that bad. Being small is a big help. It's very hard to get this to work at a large scale. That's always been true of associational government. Can I follow up on that question? Yeah, of course. Wouldn't you argue that like, Scandinavian countries probably have a bigger government than America, just in the sense that like, the social welfare and such? Yeah, I mean, there are some differences, but they've generally walked back from the brink. Okay, the story of Sweden, for example, is Sweden got prosperous with very limited government. It could then afford socialism. It tried it, it found it was a disaster, and it's backed off. S Sweden is a very free market economy today. Um, and that's happened in the Dutch, was a similar story. In New Zealand and Australia, similar stories. Britain, to some extent. Uh, so, yeah. So it's, uh, so size is a big problem, and that's the big problem for the United States. So, yes? So you say credit is both tax and regulatory uh, government policy? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's using force to reallocate resources, if you like, from one person to another. And it, it can be, it doesn't have to be just taxes. Right. Um, but in those European countries that you just mentioned, don't they have uh, they have a free market, but they have so no regulatory government policies, but they have high taxes for the social welfare programs? Are you uh, yeah, but less than they used to. That's actually reduced. And I, remember, there's a lot of ruin in a nation, so we're not asking for perfection, right? I mean, we can ask, but we won't get it. <laughs> uh, what we want is for government not to be too bad. And in the not too bad, they're better than we are. We're worse. Okay, it doesn't mean that they're perfect by any means. And it does, certainly doesn't mean that we can imitate them because we're huge. It, does, it won't work. Okay, what, what works for the Swiss won't work for us. Okay, I, I don't know what will, uh, unfortunately. Any other, any other questions? So sort of at the end of our time. Thank you very much, Mayor Cohen, and thank yeah. you for coming.